guys I know as uh, some of my patients, and I'm happy to have you guys here at 7 o'clock, so thanks for staying, because we could all be at dinner, I'm sure. Um, what I thought I would do is just present some data and some information for you guys, because this is really a learning session on what myositis is. Um, but feel free to interrupt me if questions arise that sort of can pertain to everyone and we can all learn. Um, maybe if we keep the questions general, it'll just help, help everyone in the room. And then it, hopefully at the end of the session, I'll try to leave some time so that we can answer more specific questions. Um, what I really want to cover in this next half an hour, 45 minutes, is just how do we figure out what type of inflammatory myopathy we have? And a lot of what we do is based on the clinical features, um, how we come to the diagnosis, and I wanted to give you guys some information on it because one of the reasons, just a little bit on my background, is I was trained in Boston, and I met a lot of patients that just had very challenging journeys on um, getting the right diagnosis, getting in the right hands of experts that understood myositis, and um, getting on the right treatment. And I think it's also really important to know that there's not a single best treatment out there, and there's several treatment options. And um, I actually have a bunch of slides at the end for patients with um, treatable myopathies, that there are several options, and I think it's very important for you guys to know about this. Um, so, a lot of times, and in these next three days, you're going to hear a lot about how we categorize inflammatory myopathies. And in general, I think there's about four big categories that you're going to hear about from polymyositis, dermatomyositis. There's a relatively newer entity called necrotizing myopathy, yeah. and that muscle disease is the muscle disease that's been associated with statin medication use, the cholesterol medication, and there's new antibodies that have been discovered that helped us identify this one. And then the reason that I put inclusion body myositis further down and separate from the three up above is that we still believe that the top three are categorized as autoimmune conditions that respond to immune treatment. Um, but inclusion body myositis, from what we have seen, does not respond to immunotherapy. So I have it further down. Um, yeah, Kwesi, you just mentioned uh, antibodies, and um, on the former chart, you had a hard to diagnose with antibodies. Is it typical that antibody testing is something that's done as part of diagnosis and treatment of this disease? So um, I think it really depends on your clinician, but my colleague and I at UC Irvine, we make it a part of our routine testing. And I, I'll show you some data that um, I find very important and very helpful in diagnosing patients accurately with the condition. I have a quick question. Yeah. You, you say that IBM isn't autoimmune or it's only partially autoimmune? So I think the jury and the verdict's still out if you um, ask all the experts. We're still unclear of the exact mechanism, which I is why. people it's an autoimmune disease. Yeah, and you know, some people categorize it. Some people wonder if it's an inflammatory condition because we see inflammation in the biopsy. Others wonder if it's a neurodegenerative condition. So um, there's still a huge war between the two different parties of what the accurate answer is. But um, bottom line is that it still seems to be unclear. I'm just curious, when you do the muscle biopsy, what exactly are you looking for? Um, I'll show you some pictures okay. on that. that might help you answer. The first thing we do in clinic is we look at the clinical features. Um, we're not about treating the tests and the antibodies and the biopsies. We want to see what the patient looks like. And what's really important, So the reason that um, 
And just to get everyone on the same page, PM stands for polymyositis, DM for nano, and the INNN is the necrotizing myopathy. That's typically the one that we are talking about, statin, cholesterol, and medication related. But the reason I lump them all together is because when we look at these patients clinically, they basically look like the same type of weakness. And generally, we're not able to distinguish what is what until we gather more information from some of the tests we perform. But generally, the weakness affects the shoulder girdle muscles, the hip girdle muscles, it makes it really hard. I teach the medical students that it's really hard um, to get out of chairs, to climb stairs, to raise your arms above your head, to do your hair. And that's a really helpful mnemonic for the medical students to remember in what muscles does it affect. The other key feature here is that it generally tends to be a symmetric disease. So both arms, both legs are typically equally affected. Females tend to be a little bit more affected than males, and these conditions respond to immune therapy. So when Dr. Mozapar and I meet with our patients and they tell us that they've been diagnosed with polymyositis for 15 years and they've been tried on prednisone, IVIG, methotrexate, and they've had no response, we really question the diagnosis and then start to wonder about inclusion body myositis. The other um, feature that separates dermatomyositis out as many of you know, is what we call the skin rash. That seems to be a hallmark, the hallmark of the disease. Um, and some patients with dermato never even develop the muscle weakness. Um, they will just have the skin rash. Another important feature is that it can also affect other uh, systemic processes. The lungs, the heart, the GI system, the joints can be affected. And one of the hallmarks of dermatomyositis that you can see here is this rash, this purplish color over the eyelids of someone. And sometimes they'll even have some swelling over the eyelids, and we call that edema or periorbital edema. And that tends to be the most classic rash with dramatic. So in the prior session, someone was questioning just a skin rash over the abdomen, and do I have IBM and dermato? Oh, as clinicians, we really look for some of these typical features. The rash over the knuckles, sometimes some dry skin or cracking of the fingertips called mechanic sands. Um, and what really separates out inclusion body myositis is the exam. So I had a patient that was diagnosed with polymyositis for 15 years, was followed at an academic center, and she said, Dr. Boyle, how did you just walk in the room and in 15 minutes tell me, change my diagnosis to inclusion body myositis? And one of the most important signs for inclusion body myositis is the asymmetric weakness, the age of onset. So again, it's the most common muscle disease over the age of 50. Um, it tends to be a slow, a progressive disease. There's a lot of atrophy in this disease, unlike dermatomyositis and polymyositis. You can sort of see the muscle wasting in the thigh muscles. It, the fingers are hard to flex. Um, quite characteristic. And for some reason, males tend to be more effective than females, but we certainly have female patients with IBM as well. Um, patients can have significant leg weakness, difficulty getting up from the chair. You can see how wide her gait base is in order to just arise from the chair. You can even have foot drops. Grip weakness is one of the hallmarks of the condition, making it difficult to write, to hold the cup. Daily functions can be quite involved at times. This sort of separates you out from polymyositis or dermatomyositis, where hand weakness is typically not seen as drastically. And another very important feature is the swallowing difficulty that arises in IBM. So I think it's an understated and overlooked 
element of the disease. Um, as clinicians, Dr. Muzaffar and I constantly screen our patients for swallowing difficulty. It can actually be one of the leading causes for pneumonias and illnesses later on in the course of the condition. So it's important for your doctors every now and then to even do a barium swallow evaluation on you if you have IBM. Um, I think you had a question. Okay. Um, so what I want to focus on is the evaluation because I think the most important part of myositis is getting the, the correct diagnosis. Before you start embarking on this journey of getting several medications to treat the condition, it's really important to make sure you have the right diagnosis. And what's really cool as myositis experts is I think there's several tools that are now available that we should use and um, you should really have your clinician that's following you make sure they're checking at least several of these elements from your muscle enzymes, the needle EMG, which points can separate out a muscle condition from a nerve condition, a muscle biopsy, and I'll show you why antibodies, and we use a lot of muscle imaging, and I'll show you why muscle MRIs can be helpful. Um, I'm going to skip the slide because I think pictures are helpful. But this is what we're looking for. I think someone had a question on the biopsy. And a lot of times there's some key features that we look for on the muscle biopsy from, the, these are your muscle fibers. And what you can see here are these black dots where there's a lot of inflammation surrounding the muscle fiber. That's often what's characteristic of polymyositis. However, um, we see this type of inflammation in inclusion body myositis. And so what separates out inclusion body myositis from polymyositis is, do you see these little holes in the muscle biopsy? We call these vacuoles, and lining these vacuoles is a little bit of reddish material. And that's why many of you with IBM may have heard the term rimmed vacuoles on your muscle biopsy, and that's what pathologists and urologists are looking for to see if you have inclusion body myositis. But the challenge is, um, which Dr. Mosafar alluded to in the earlier session, is that there's now published data that sometimes up to 40% of IBM patients don't have these characteristic room vacuoles. And so a lot of times your pathology report will come back and say, oh, you have polymyositis. And you wonder, well, why did the doctor say I have polymyositis when now the next neurologist is telling me I have inclusion body myositis? Because not always do the muscle biopsy show these characteristic features. Um, can you get um, accurate, reasonable, I don't know what the right word is there, muscle biopsies once treatment has begun? Um, so, especially for endometrial, uh, sorry, for polymyositis and dermatomyositis, if you've been on steroids, that can mask the inflammation. Typically, the rimmed vacuoles don't go away, but the challenge is rimmed vacuoles like that for IBM are not seen in every single muscle fiber. Remember, your doctor is just taking a few centimeters of a muscle tissue. And so it's possible to not get an accurate sample of your disease process in that biopsy. So, and then treatment can affect your inflammation. And it can also affect um, perivesicular atrophy, which is a key feature for dermatomyositis. So absolutely. Don't they have blood tests that they can do for autoantibodies too? Are you gonna try You're to like leading me to my next slide, oh. so let's do it. Um, so, the, so that's why we find it very helpful to not only do a biopsy. Someone was asking me in the prior session is, why can't I just have another reread on my biopsy? Why do I have to have some of these other tests? Because we believe that the biopsy is a part of the puzzle, but it may not give the entire picture. So 
I think the more elements that you can collect are very helpful. And we find the mice site as antibodies very helpful. I think Dr. Mosafar is giving a session tomorrow on um, just the antibody data alone. So I'm not going to harp on this too much, um, but there are now several antibodies that have been found that are associated not only with the specific disease, right, if it's an antisynthetase syndrome or if it's dermatomyositis, but it can also give you information on your prognosis. How well are you going to respond to immunotherapy? Um, how um, high is your risk for cancer? And I'll, I'll show you the slide in a second. Um, and then, is your diagnosis, so if you don't have the antibodies and you've been diagnosed with polymyositis and you're over the age of 50, um, it's worthwhile to challenge that diagnosis. The other important thing is, like I said, it can help you with prognosis and um, cancer, there are now cancer-related antibodies. So if you have the TIF-1 gamma antibody or the NXP2 antibody in dermatomyositis, there's actually a high association with cancer. And I'll tell you that um, you don't have to worry about cancer and inclusion body myositis, um, but if you have been diagnosed with dermatomyositis, up to the first three years is what the published data suggests, um, there is a possibility, there's about a 40% possibility over the age of 40 um, to have an underlying malignancy. Would, would, would um, that be a normal check? I mean, <clears throat> I guess. I'm sorry? Would that be a normal standard testing? or your rheumatologist, your dermatologist, who does these testing? So, as the person diagnosing someone with dermatomyositis, I have detected, just even in the past few months, I've detected two cancers, so I order the test. And I'll show you, um, are you so. Order, are you ordering those specific antibody testing, or are you ordering cancer screening testing? Wait. So, so I always order the antibodies, and then if I diagnose someone with dermatomyositis and they're within the first three years of symptom onset, um, I typically start with either a chest CT or abdomen, but I order the screening test as the diagnosing and treating doctor, and I know that the risk is high. Um, but the reason I'm pulling up this slide is because there was a recent study that compared routine, what we call conventional screening for cancer, mm -hmm. which is a chest, abdomen, um, CAT scan, as well as a mammography if you're a female, and a gyne exam, and some blood tests. Um, that's equally effective, if not um, a PET scan is even better um, than just some of the routine conventional scans. So I typically argue with insurance companies about this data, and I use this data, and I've actually always been able to get a PET scan in my patients with dramatomyces. So I, I do find it very helpful. Did you list all the antibodies in the last slide? Uh, no. Oh, no, so sorry. Yeah. Okay, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, um, but there are, so now with the necrotizing myopathy, there are two antibodies that are more specific, and that one's the SRP, and the HMGCR antibody has been found. Um, about 60% of patients with this antibody have had cholesterol medication statins. But there is still about 40% of patients that have never seen a statin and still have this antibody. And a part of the reason is we, th we know that statins actually are hiding in our foods, too. So mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, for some reason, has a high um, natural statin in the food. Um, so if you're an oyster mushroom soup lover, you might want to think twice if you have the HMGCR antibody. Um, red rice yeast, there's some supplements. So if you're a big California supplement person, 
um, as I've met a lot of Californian patients, I know, I've seen a lot of them are into these diets, bad diets, and these supplements, and it's important to check the ingredients in them, especially if you have the statin antibody, the HMGCR antibody. Going back to your last slide, what is a PET scan? What does PET stand for? Oh gosh. Why am I blinking? Dr. Mosebar, what does that stand for? It's positron uh, emission technology. Oh, okay. We, we always call it a PET scan, so uh -huh. no. Um, it's, it's, it's a radiographic type of test, uh -huh. um, but what's cool is it covers from head to toe. Uh -huh. So I actually had one patient a few years ago with a really refractory dermatomyositis and she had the routine screening, and they never found a cancer, but then we put her, but the routine screening is really from neck and, you know, um, groin, torso area. Um, and she, after her PET scan, she was found to have a tumor in her nasopharynx area. So um, I find PET scans much more helpful, and it's one single test. So, so these are the antibodies that are associated with necrotizing mass. So if you want to screen for bowel cancers that usually are done with dermatomyositis, Correct. and you only get a PET scan done, uh -huh. you don't have to do anything else, or do you still have to investigate all those different five uh, cancers and get a PET scan? Done? So, yeah, no, so according to this study, they compared PET scan to all of these other tests. And they found that the PET scan actually was higher yield. So that's what the study proposed, that a PET scan may be even better than doing, why do all these separate tests? But I mean, would you mm -hmm. still do a mammogram without it? Uh, no, if you're getting, getting the PET scan, scan that's right. I, I, I think yeah. the challenge is, is that it's very costly to do the PET scan, so they ought to do the other. That's, that's my experience. And, and so that's why as clinicians, like having this data published, a lot of times we'll actually reference it and say, well, according to this article, this um, shows that it was higher yield and it detected a cancer higher. So it's, it's helpful. That's why as clinicians, we like to do these studies and publish them. Um, and that's where you know your guys' participation is quite helpful because you actually contribute to moving the field in order our ability to fight with insurance companies. But the PET, the PET, I'm sorry, the PET, PET scan would only be done only if you're uh, NXP2, sorry? Um, so for TIF1 gamma and NXP2 antibodies, there's a very high association with cancer. So we recommend extensive screening. So your, the doctor would know? Right. Who's ever on the rated up on the blood works? Yeah. But there's a bunch of the blood works that they order, there's a lot of stuff. It's like, what does that mean? You know? Yeah, I mean, technically, if, you're, yeah. if your doctor is a good doctor, he would explain to you that, oh, this antibody came back high. Um, and really, it's only relevant for dermatomyositis patients. Um, there's not an increased risk seen in IBM, or, and it's also in the first three years. It's so only, let's say if I've met someone who's 10 years into the diagnosis, and they're coming more for treatment management, I worry less about a cancer. I may do it once and then just say, okay, we don't have to repeat it. But usually it should be repeated six months to a year out, up to the first three years of symptom onset. What, once, once you're diagnosed with cancer, because you have DM, and you go through all the treatments, what are the percentages of that reoccurring? Is it more prevalent because you have DM, or is it just as a normal cancer <clears throat> patient? The cancer recurring? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's data out there on cancer recurrence, and I'm not sure if I've actually ever even seen cancer recurrence in a DM patient. So what we do know is that if you undergo cancer treatment, the DM tends to get better too. Because it's the same treatment. Yeah, because we believe it's like, well, it's not necessarily the same treatment, because they still have to go through chemotherapy and stuff. But um, we do think that it's part of the process. And it's like, 
So what comes first, the egg or the chicken? So we actually think that the cancer is what triggers the DM, but a lot of times we are seeing the DM first clinically, and the cancer is very microscopic. But so that's why the stress can trigger DM as well. Right? I'm sorry. Stress, extreme stress, can trigger DM as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think stress is considered to trigger many neurologic <laughs> conditions. So that's a that's a that's huge the topic. topic. Yeah. <laughs> the other very important antibody that we have found very helpful. This was first described by Dr. Greenberg's group and the Dutch group is the NT5C1A antibody. And I've got some cheerleaders in the room that are cheering, but the reason that they're cheering is because um, we've been able to turn around their diagnosis just by simply sending this blood test. So the blood test initially was reported to be about 60 to 70 percent sensitive. Some of the papers now say it's 30 to 70 percent sensitive. Regardless, it's still very specific for IBM. And what's great is it's a non-invasive test. So not all IBM patients have it, but um, the sand body has been detected in up to 60 to 70 percent of patients. There's a small percentage of lupus and Sjogren's patients that have it, 20 to 14 percent, um, but those patients don't have muscle weakness. Um, and what several studies have now shown is that it's been very helpful in distinguishing it from polymyositis. So if you have the antibody and you're over the age of 50, um, you should really question your diagnosis if you're carrying a diagnosis of polymyositis. If your doctor hasn't checked this antibody and you're over the age of 50 and you're carrying the diagnosis of polymyositis, Dr. Mozapar and I would really encourage you to check, have your doctor check this antibody. We have found it very useful. Um, we actually have done a small study that of 25 patients that found that if you have the antibody, it might predict um, a more severe disease. And so we're actually in the planning stages of doing a much larger study. After we published this data, the European group um, did reproduce our data, so they found very similar results. Um, but we want to do a larger study to even get a better understanding of why do some patients have the antibody, why don't they, what their muscle biopsy might look like, and what does it mean in the long run. So I think we're going to learn more. It was just discovered in 2013. Another very helpful technique that we use and tool we use is muscle imaging. Um, I think muscle imaging is sort of a newer tool. Not many doctors are using it, but we have found it very helpful to look at how the muscle looks like, what muscles are particularly involved. We know in IBM the forearm muscles can be involved. Some people don't even have involvement clinically. Their grip might be fine, but we have found that imaging their forearm shows changes even before the patient has grip involvement. And we actually have a patient we followed in clinic now for four years, and when we first met him a few years ago, he had no grip weakness. When we had him squeeze one of our grip meters, he was gripping out like 110 pounds. But we suspected he had IBM, so we did an MRI of his forearm, and we found changes there, and now four years later, he grips at about 60 pounds. So he's lost 40 pounds just in four years, and he now has clear finger grip involvement. So we have found it a helpful tool to even diagnose patients and differentiate do they have PM or IBM. The other um, helpful idea is to even monitor disease progression. So um, there might be some clinical trials that are now even using muscle imaging, give, a, give someone a drug and use muscle imaging to see how are we changing the muscle because as we know in the room, strength may not change over time um, as quickly, but sometimes pictures 
may be able to detect changes that we can't see visually um, on exam. So I think we're going to be learning a lot more about muscle imaging in the upcoming years. And so Dr. Mosafar and I try to image a lot of our patients. This is just a slide that there's already been studies looking at the differences between a necrotizing myopathy, an IVM patient, a polymyositis patient, and a dermatome patient. This is a cross section of a thigh muscle, just looking at the differences. Um, and they just wanted you to know why you might be hearing more about muscle imaging. Um, we also see different patterns in uh, patients with IVM separating them out from polymyositis for dermatomyositis. This is one of the patients I was talking about. If you look at his forearm, this is the muscle, the whited out muscle is a muscle that in particular affects your finger flexors that seems to be more affected than other muscles in his forearm. And this is sort of what we look for if some of my IBM patients are here, this is why we've put you through imaging um, because we're looking for these patterns to make sure, are they consistent? Because what at the end of the day, we want to make sure your diagnosis is correct before we start embarking on um, several medications. But I do want um, some of you with dermato, poly, and the necrotizing myopathy, what I do want to tell you is I find it a very treatable condition. I think it's important to know that there are several options. The patients generally, if you're on the right therapy, will have a good response to treatment. And I think it's really important to know, don't be overwhelmed that you're meeting patients and one patient's on methotrexate and another one's on azathioprine. It's not necessarily that one drug works better than another. It's what drug works best for you. Um, now you say good response, but good response can be, it'll be comfortable for a while, but then you have a flare-up. Yeah. So it doesn't mean no flare-up. And, and I think part of the flare-ups are knowing when to taper your medications, when um, to adjust your medications, when to add another medication. There's a lot of tricks with the flare-ups, and I do have a slide talking about the flare-ups because I think that's part of the challenge in managing um, some of these conditions appropriately. So I think we all agree as experts that steroids are one of the first medications we use. It's very helpful. There are several second medications we'll add on as different options. Um, I find IVIG quite effective in our dramato necrotizing myopathy patients. We use rituximab. We use it for patients with more severe disease or ones that haven't responded. And then there's a lot of other medications that we have in our back pocket that have um, side effects but can be effective if some, if some of these other agents don't work. And so some important things to think about is how to start steroids. But in general, we like to start steroids at a higher dose. You know, some people go up to 60 or 80. I tend to use around 40 milligrams in patients with very severe disease or other systemic involvement, meaning other systems involved. I even use IV steroids sometimes. Um, but I think one of the most important points to remember is that steroids, even if you've responded, don't be quick to come off the steroids. They really should be maintained at a high dose for two to four months. So one of the most common reasons for flare-ups to happen is because some doctors will say, oh, you're doing great, and the patient says, yes, but I hate these steroids. They have ugly side effects. Let's get off of it. And within a month, they may taper, or the taper regimen is too fast. So we do believe there is a method to the madness of tapering the steroids, and you should really go slow on that taper. And there, a lot of times we recommend um, tapers by, I tend to be even slower 
Um, I know this slide says even every four weeks, but I'll tell you, I often wait eight to 12 weeks um, to taper my steroids, and I really go down by only 10 milligrams. And then when we get to 20, my taper gets even slower. Um, I think it's the rapid taper that results in this bouncing back and forth of the disease, and that's a lot of times where flare-ups and exacerbations happen. Um, the other important thing is steroids are very good, but they're ugly drugs, so they have tons of side effects, and it's important for your doctors to monitor all the side effects. Um, getting on vitamin D, calcium, making sure that you're seeing the dietitian if you're having problems with weight gain can be really important and the key to being and staying on prednisone because i meet a lot of patients that will say yeah i tried it but i i couldn't tolerate it and um, i think it's just really important to be able to monitor work with your primary care doctor if need be the other important thing is starting a second medication. So we know that you can't be on prednisone forever because of these ugly side effects. And so we like to start a second line agent. A lot of times, earlier on in the condition, especially if someone has moderate disease, um, because it can reduce your flare-ups, um, and it allows for your doctor to come down on your steroids, sometimes even faster than you would if you were just on steroids alone. Um, so I often, when I've diagnosed someone with <coughs> dermatomyositis or a statin-related muscle disease, I will often put them on a second agent quite early on in the course of their condition. And generally, I start with either methotrexate or azathioprine. Methotrexate is a weekly medication. And I believe these slides are gonna be available to you guys. So. I'm not going to go through the details, but I just wanted to give you the overview. And azathioprine is daily dosing, twice daily. A lot of times it's dependent on what you can tolerate, what works best for you. I have found that methotrexate tends to work a little bit faster than azathioprine, so I tend to use a little bit more methotrexate than I do azathioprine. Um, and I think that's just because of my experience with better results on these medications. Um, for my older patients that have a hard time remembering just take it once a week, then I go to azathioprine. And so I take some of these um, things into the association, but the pill boxes, my older patients tell, tell me work great too, and then they don't forget. So there are other options. Um, IVIG, I actually am starting to lean towards and using earlier on. If someone has pretty severe disease, I start with IVIG, steroids, and then often add methotrexate up front. Um, it seems to work fast. It seems to work quite efficacious. And we know for the statin-induced myopathies, it, turn, it seems to work really well. So. Um, another agent you might hear about is rituximab, and we tend to use rituximab more for the patients that have seen um, prednisone, have seen some of these other agents, and have not had a good response, uh, will then go to rituximab. And I think a part of it is that it's a more potent drug, um, there's possibility of some more side effects and tolerability issues, and um, we have less experience with it than some of these more common agents. So, so the reason that I have the statin-related myopathy on a separate slide is just because um, this antibody was discovered relatively recently, so we're just now learning about how to treat these patients. But we do find that IVIG is quite helpful in these patients. And um, they do quite well on these medications. So I'm going to switch to IBM because I know a lot of you have IBM in this room as well. And um, I know it feels like we're not moving the field. I've been hearing that a lot from some of the patients I'm talking to. But I, I think a part of the challenge that has been in moving the field and advancing it 
is trying to figure out what still causes um, IBM. And we're still unclear if it's inflammation as the first um, thing that destroys the muscle fibers, or if inflammation happens as a secondary reaction after the muscle fibers are degenerating and the inflammation then comes in to sort of clean up that debris. We're still, there's several studies that have looked at what the cause is. But that's part of the reason why we know that maybe it's not an inflammatory condition is because they've tried several immune medications in IBM. And if you look at several studies that have been published, they've all actually failed when they look at immune treatment. Steroids have been tried, uh, the trexate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, all of these studies have been done. And um, so when you meet some of us and we say, sorry, we're not putting you on an immune treatment, it's because it has actually been formally looked at. Um, IVIG has also been looked at in IBM patients, and there's really been no statistical improvement. And there was actually a study that was published in 2011 that looked at what it, how do patients that have been treated with immune suppression in IBM compare to those that have never seen immune suppression. And unfortunately, this study, and I don't want to scare any of you, it's a small study and it's retrospective, but there has been some data to suggest that patients that saw immune suppression um, were had increased use of wheelchairs, assistive devices, in comparison to IBM patients that have never seen immune therapy. So the question we ask as clinicians is, do we do more harm by even putting someone on steroids or IVIG or some immune therapy? And then there's, yeah. Um, I was on uh, medications. Yeah. I'm, I'm SIBM. And it seemed like it lowered the CK level, but as your slide said, I got weaker and weaker with that. It seemed like I was stronger for the first year, and then after that, it was downhill. So, so we know steroids um, actually lower the CK level. Um, we know it even from our muscular dystrophy patients with a genetic condition. If they, um, these patients, a lot of these muscular dystrophy patients, um, have a very high CK level. And if we put them on steroids, within um, weeks to months, their CK will start to lower. They certainly don't get better, but what it's doing is treating some of the inflammation yeah. and reducing some of that inflammation. And that but, the strength. Right, and so that's why we as doctors have always questioned, well then, if we can even change the inflammation, is inflammation the cause of the disease in IBM or not? Because it doesn't seem to affect the strength. Is that, is that true? Is that true also for DM? No. So if your CK levels go down, you increase in strength. So, um, so what we have seen, I mean, it, it's not always a perfect correlation. So we don't constantly check our CK levels. Um, for us, the strength exam and the rash is much more important to monitor than the CK level. It's like treating the patient versus treating the lab, right? But we do see a correlation. I will tell you that in patients that started off in like 2000, and we see that they're getting better, their CKs tend to drop to, and normalize too. And then if they have a flare up, I'm not talking about a little hundred here and there, because otherwise, if you're chasing your CK level, you'll drive yourself nuts. But um, major changes can reflect um, changes in your disease process. Does that make sense? In, in my experience with the IBM, my CK was down to 150, which I, they say is normal, mm -hmm. and yet I felt the worst I've ever felt. Yeah, Strength. and what we have seen in IBM patients is that over time, the CK falls. And the CK, remember, is a reflection of your muscle fiber getting damaged. But as we know in IBM over time, 
a lot of the muscle fiber is just damaged, so there's not an ongoing damage or break mm -hmm. that is causing the CK to leak out of the yeah, muscle. That's my next question. The more yeah. damage your muscle has, maybe it's still going to. Yeah, I mean, I've seen patients with, you know, a bad myositis in the ICU setting to the point where they can't even move and their CK is 15. Yeah. And it's just because there's so much muscle damage that there's nothing else to damage anymore. Yeah, yeah because that was my next question. I'm diabetic. And uh, so my CKs were never higher than 60. Mm -hmm. But yet, I was diagnosed July 4, but I had the symptoms for a year. And my muscle strain on the, uh, on the testing uh, was only 17%, but I should be at least 75% of my age. And I was so, so sick with swelling problems, the skin problems, muscle weakness. And the worst time that I was was when it was low. And and mine was never high. I hear of people that have yeah. you know, thousands. Mine never went up higher than 360. Mm -hmm. But yet, even at 280, 180, I'm very, very sick. And so mine never went up sky high. Right, and in a lot of, and you shouldn't be confused that if you don't, so both in inclusion body myositis and in dermatomyositis, we have seen patients with normal CKs, and that's actually uh, um, well-published information that you don't have to have a major elevation in CK. But then unfortunately, a lot of the doctors don't know that. Yeah. And a lot of the doctors told, misdiagnosed me because my CKs were not in the thousands. Right. It was my neurologist and and other specialists that said, you know what, we're not looking just at that. We look at you as a person and you have all the symptoms. I had a rheumatologist call me and say, I have someone that looks like dermatomyositis, but the CK's not high. Am I missing <laughs> something? <laughs> no, but, but, but this is a common question. Yeah, and my EMG yeah. was very abnormal. My yeah. EMG was very, very abnormal. Right. And that's why we use all these other yeah. tools, because you know, my slide of the evaluation where it listed the muscle enzymes, the antibodies, the muscle MRI, is because I think it, there's different pieces of the puzzle, and the more tools you use to help get that diagnosis, yeah, the more confident you feel in your diagnosis. So one of the specialists told me, not always, but they believe that when your CK's levels are always low, that it's showing you that you can have a higher risk of a running cancer with PM. If, if it was always on the lower side. I have never heard of a normal CK. No, I mean a lower, a lower CK. Yeah, no, or a low CK yeah. correlating with oh. malignancy. I think the antibodies are what's more helpful, and Dr. Mosafar is also shaking his head no. So um, you have two opinions that we read a lot in the literature. Yeah, it's just you get a lot of mis yeah. misinformation. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I, I, you know, I think that's why this conference is really helpful yeah. for patients because I sort of feel shocked when I hear patient stories. Um, mm -hmm. and. I think this is a great conference for you guys for that reason. There's a lot of work being done in IBM. I mean, we're, we're looking at several agents. Many of you guys know that the next biggest trial that's planned in the US is the Aramophthamol clinical trial. It was based on a placebo-controlled trial of 16 active patients aged with placebo. What we know about the drug is that there might be some effect at the inflammation and degeneration level. And um, in this study that was done in 2013, it was well tolerated and there was a trend. It didn't show statistical significance and improvement in the IBM functional rating scale, but there was a trend to show some improvement. So that's why a larger study is planned. Um, some of you may have heard of or participated in the Novartis BYM338 or Bimagrumab study. The concept behind this study was that if you can inhibit myostatin, which um, results in muscle hypertrophy, so this Belgian blue cow and this mouse here received myostatin, and they call this mouse the mighty mouse, because you can see it's like muscle, huge muscles, right? 
And so the idea was, well, we know IBM patients have muscle wasting. So if we can make their muscles larger, we can make them mighty mouse, right? Um, and so I was actually in Boston when we did this um, proof of concept study in 14 IBM patients. And what you're seeing here is that after we gave this drug, after eight weeks, they did an MRI of the thigh muscle at, before patients received the drug and then after patients received the drug. And the patients that received the drug are in blue. And we actually grew muscle and the thigh muscle volume increased in comparison to placebo patients. So the FDA said, hey, you've got something here, and um, which is why it led to the worldwide 240 patient study, and I don't have that slide because it's still not um, published, but unfortunately, that worldwide study showed that we were able to grow muscle, but all the muscle we grew was not stronger, unfortunately, and all the measurements that measured function of the muscle failed. Um, very disappointing study. I was part of that study, too. I remember the call that we had in Europe at 11 p.m., and I didn't sleep that night because um, I was disappointed. But we move on. I think we learned a lot from that study. We're trying to figure out what the best measures for IBM are in order to monitor what drug works. We do know that there's a lot of other care that's very important in IBM patients that helps on a daily basis. So it's important, we feel, that our patients should be in a multidisciplinary clinic where all these elements can be monitored um, and help you on a daily um, basis. So this is my last slide. And I've been now taking care of my ascitis patients for 10 years. And for me, I think the clinical aspect is what's most important. I've met so many patients with a painful, long diagnostic odyssey journey. A lot of patients that have been misdiagnosed. But I think we're entering a very cool era. I mean, even from just five years ago, a lot of these antibodies, muscle imaging, um, all the different therapies that are now becoming available, and the new clinical trials that are in the horizon, um, I think it's I think we're turning myositis around, and um, I hope you guys feel that way, but I think we're really pushing the field. I have a quick question. So, uh, I have polymyositis, and I've responded well <coughs> to prednisone um, in the past with my players and such. My question is, is there a dosage which you would think is, is sort of like a safe zone, like 5, 10, 15 milligrams, where you say it's okay to have that much, but not more than that, like, would you consider that to be so, reasonable? So we generally consider 20 milligrams or less of prednisone as low dose, okay. but there isn't necessarily a magic number that I look at as much as what we do in clinic is we push and pull at each one of your muscles, and we sort of score your muscle strength and we see how you're doing, and then based on that, we start at a certain dose, and then more than the magic number of the dose, I think what's most important is how your physician tapers your prednisone. So we generally <coughs> don't like to go down by five to 10 milligrams every two to three months until, and we don't taper if you're not stable or not better. So if you're in the slope of getting better, you don't want to taper and abort that slope, right? But if you're on a maintenance strength, and you tell me that your strength has been perfect for the past three months, then I'm much more comfortable lowering your dose from where you were. So generally, if you're on 20 milligrams or less, I tend not to go down by more than five milligrams, sometimes even 2.5 milligrams every two to three. But I don't think I can give you a magic number of prednisone without knowing what your exam is. Yeah. Um, do you have any patients who have also have lupus or have had a history of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis who have then been diagnosed with 
uh, polymyositis and IBM. <laughs> Just so um, we tend to see it more in like dermatomyositis patients or this overlap syndrome of myositis patients. I don't particularly see it in IBM patients as a higher incidence. Does that answer your question? I'm just sort of wondering what you do with that because we have past, uh, past diagnoses with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and now finally IBM. And, yeah. and I'm sort of wondering you know, how much of this is really... Misdiagnoses uh, yeah, yeah. and finally... Yeah, and I'll tell you, I think that's more common yeah. that someone was first told they have lupus because they saw a rheumatologist, maybe it's rheumatoid arthritis, and then it, but it's the same process, and then they're finally diagnosed with IBM when the weakness becomes more clear. But if it's a remote history, like in her teenage years, she had lupus, that's a different story. Well, I'm talking about 20, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, if, if, if they're being treated for lupus now, but they also have IBM, should we revisit whether the lupus treatments are? Yeah, is she being treated for lupus based on antibodies yeah. and based on, um, so it's, it's helpful to get a second opinion yeah. sometimes um, and ask what the basis of the diagnosis is and if it's based on blood tests or not, mm -hmm. or if it was just an empiric diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my mom has DM and PM and had a, um, J01 antibody. Joe one. one. But she also has an anti RO52 antibody. I've not, not seen that anywhere. Do you know anything about that antibody? Uh, R52. So RO52. Oh, RO. So R52 is very common. Very common. So it's actually probably the commonest the antibody that you see in myositis. Oh, okay. But it's yeah. not specific to myositis. Oh, okay. so, so the JO1 is, is more specific to the anti-synthetase syndrome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is what, yeah. yeah. and the RO52 um, can coexist. Mm -hmm. Like your blood test can be positive, but it just suggests, yes, there's a myositis in there. Yeah. Right, but it's not. It's JO1 is JO1 is really specific. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is she doing OK? Ah. Uh, yeah, she's better now that she has the infusions. I see. She always had lots of flare-ups before then, but once she started the infusion, she kind of got Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. I think we, uh, this might be our last question, I guess. Oh, okay. I'll bring it. Uh -huh. um, for for DM, we'll make it good. Yeah, uh -huh. right. Uh, for DM, um, is it the muscles and the, and the skin being attacked, or are the capillaries throughout the body being attacked? I read recently it was actually the capillaries, not the muscle per se, or the skin per se. So, so we do know that there are DM patients that won't have any muscle involvement and can just have skin involvement. But it's sort of, I think what you're asking is what's coming first? Is a, well, no, what do we what's actually being attacked? Well, well, all your organs will have capillaries, right? And so there's some evidence to suggest that it's the, the capillaries that are causing the end organ damage. To, does that make sense? So, but it's not that it starts off in the muscle and spreads right, right. elsewhere. Is yeah. that what you're asking? Yeah. That it's originating through the capillaries yeah. and the capillary supply. Which is why it affects so many systems over time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for staying. <laughs> um, um, I was told to tell you to pull out your evaluation sheet <laughs> and fill it in to tell Bob if you want me back or not. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Chris Harris. I have uh, dermatomyositis. I was first diagnosed in 2005. So this is my 12th year and this is my first year to this meeting, which I'm kicking myself for, but going forward I'll be at every one. Um, my favorite part of this meeting is meeting the patients and their advocates and I'm amazed at the support that I've received since I've been here from everybody. And I love that people have shared their stories, no matter how challenging, but I love the idea of hope for everybody. And my second favorite part of this meeting is the individuals have, who have donated their time to move this disease forward and try to find a cure, which includes everybody with the Myositis Foundation as well as the panel. Every person who has volunteered their time, the physicians, the physical therapists, the volunteers, and the fact that they've committed to do this as they move forward is amazing to me and I love it and I will be here again next year and the year after that and it just gives me a lot of hope when I was very depressed. So thank you for inviting us, thank you for supporting it and I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Hello, my name is Anastasia Victorson and I came here all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm very happy to be here. Is of course. this your first time coming to the uh, to this conference, yes, to the TMA conference the first time. What's it been like? It's been fantastic, very informative. I've met my friends, my Facebook friends, and uh, I think, I hope I'll be able to come again. Um, I have polymyositis, but I also have a syndrome that's called the anti-synthesis syndrome. Uh, I have antibodies, a lot of them, but anti jo one is the most common one. And I also have ILD, quite serious. But getting medication, feeling quite okay. The doctor saved my life. Yeah. Very good information. And it's also nice to see the persons. I read a lot. It's also nice to see them in real life, to be able to interact with the doctors. Yes. I'm just happy to be here, having met you too. Take care. And everybody else that hasn't been here, hasn't gotten a chance, please try, because this was really worth it. It's beyond my expectations, really. Thank you.